Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the space pitches of Galileo Masters and Copernicus Masters. We are broadcasting to you live from Munich today. And you might wonder why I'm wearing a dindel. Let me tell you, there are many reasons for it. First of all, of course, because the Oktoberfest got cancelled and I kind of miss it this year. But second, and this is even more important, AZO, the company that initiated the G Galileo Masters and the Copernicus Masters and this new event, the Space Pitches, is based in Bavaria. So it all started here. And I would say this is enough reason to go Bavarian again. My name is Ines Kühnert and I'm the head of Galileo and Copernicus competitions at AZO and I will be your host today. I'm sure that we are gathering a lot of space enthusiasts in this event, and I'm really curious what we will be learning today. We will address the most recent challenges Earth is facing in thematic areas and see how space startup ecosystem can help solve them. But before we get started, let me give the floor to our CEO, Thorsten Rudolf. He started all this 16 years ago and brought it back home today. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome also from my side at the space pitches of the prestigious Galileo Masters and Copernicus Masters dedicated to the winners of the Galileo and Copernicus regional prizes powered by the European Commission. 16 years ago, we started building an innovation network together with our partners in order to support innovators such as companies, startups, students or scientific staff from almost all parts of the world in implementing their product ideas and business models in the satellite navigation and Earth observation downstream business. This year, we celebrate the 17th edition of the Space Awards. And after having organized this unique event at various locations in Europe in the past years, we unfortunately had to switch to a virtual format this year. But there are other positive developments this year. We have extended the Space Awards with today's Space Pitches to honor our regional winners. We all have to be patient for one more day for this year's Space Award. And today, I look very much forward to the presentations of the top 30 winning teams and their innovative applications coming from different regions and countries across Europe. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our three special guest experts from the space and venture capital sectors. I'm very pleased that we were able to win three fantastic ladies to contribute to the space pitches today. Many thanks goes to Candice Johnson, Uli Fricke and Martina Sindela. I'm sure that they will not only give exciting feedback to the winning teams, but will also offer us an insightful and entertaining next three hours. The backbone of the Galileo and Copernicus Masters Network has always been our international partner ecosystem. This year, 126 partners from 34 countries offer their resources to help startup companies and innovations from research and industry, driving innovative business models, products and services to tackle mobility, connectivity, digital and climate change challenges. We are very proud that today we have an incredible network of research institutions, space agencies, European institutions and ministries, industrial partners, banks and venture capitalists, clusters and technology parks, and more than 50 business incubators to support innovators all over Europe. Thank you very much to all our regional prize partners for the enthusiasm and motivation to cultivate and grow the seeds of the space entrepreneurship. I would also like to express our gratitude to the European Commission for their support for our network this year, and we look forward to a continuation of this joint effort to further strengthen the space innovation ecosystem in Europe and beyond. Finally, I wish all participants success and uh, lots of fun with their presentations today and would like to thank our three experts once again for their kind commitment. And with this, I return to our moderator for today's Space Pitches, Ines Kühnert. Thank you, Thorsten. As you already mentioned, all this would not have been possible without the European Commission. 
Together with our local partner network, they support the winners financially with more than 800,000 euros in 2020 only. Please welcome with me Christoph Kautz, the head of unit at DG Defis in the European Commission. Good evening to all of you. I'm pleased to have the opportunity opening this session that is dedicated to present and award the winners of the Galileo and Copernicus regional prizes. We will surely see a broad range of very different projects, but they will all show us the significant potential of the European space programs Galileo and Copernicus when it comes to the use of their data and signals in innovative applications and solutions. And the regional aspect in this competition adds an additional interesting layer. From the Commission side, this year's competition is of particular interest. Whereas we have the Re Galileo Regional Prizes competition since a couple of years, this year is the first time that the Commission initiated and su supported Copernicus Regional Prizes. We are very pleased that the response was so positive and that so many regions replied to our initiative. It shows the interest of regions in the space program. In particular, looking at the overall difficult situation this year, we express our thank you to all of you who actively participate in the organization of the prizes. It is very encouraging to see that the European space programs stimulate such a strong regional uptake. It is of high importance to raise awareness of the great potential space data and signals offer for building up business models. I am now looking forward to the presentations of all the winners and their projects, and I wish you all the best for your future. Thank you very much, Christoph, and uh, thanks to the EC and our partners for their dedication and support this year. As you already heard, we will be learning about the latest innovation solution from our regional prize winners of Galileo Masters and Copernicus Masters now, followed by a short discussion with our ladies expert panel. So let us welcome the ladies. Martina Sindela, she is the representative of the European Commission who is dialing in from Brussels today. Welcome, Martina. Thanks a lot, Ines. Uh, thanks a lot um, for the invitation. I'm really looking forward for this uh, session. It's really a, a great honor for me to be here. I'm also glad, of course, uh, that I see my, my um, panel colleagues again. And um, as I said, um, it will be certainly an amazing evening tonight, today. And uh, yes, I'm really excited and uh, looking, looking forward for the pitches. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Martina. Our next expert is Uli Fricke. She's the CEO of Funder Nation and an interested potential investor who has also experience in setting up crowdfunding campaigns. Welcome, Uli. Yes, thank you very much and hello, everybody. I'm really excited about seeing the pitches and hearing about the upcoming innovations in the space ecosystem. We're looking forward to many great funding opportunities. Thank you very much, Uli. And last but not least, Candice Johnson from Johnson Paradigma Ventures. She has been working with space startups all her life and is an expert for that market. Hello, everybody. It's absolutely great to be here with my friends and to get to know new entrepreneurs. Obviously, space is the place to be right now. I think that Europe has really led uh, the world in Earth observation uh, with the Copernicus, with the Galileo uh, masters. Um, we should not forget that ASA is the, and the European Commission are actually the world's largest space incubators. Um, we would not have all of these fantastic young entrepreneurs were it not without the help of ASA. So big congratulations to all. And I'm really excited about seeing some new entrepreneurs um, and some new innovations. Thank you very much, Candice. Ladies, I'm really looking forward to our conversation about the solutions to be presented soon. You all know that space data is creating increasing impact on innovations and growth in many industries. We tried to cluster the winners of the Copernicus Prizes and the Galileo Prizes in sessions that focus specifically on these areas and challenges we are facing. In seven sessions today, we will be looking closely at solutions for agriculture and forestry, health and well-being, 
mobility, transport and logistics, emergency safety and security, drones and robotics, energy, oil and gas, environment and climate. So let us finally reach for the stars of this evening. In our first session, we will be addressing one of the biggest challenges we are facing all over the world, water scarcity and hunger. How can EU space data support us in finding a solution to feed the world? The goal in agriculture and forestry is to become sustainable, save water and fertilizer. Earth observation data delivers information about the soil moisture and the condition of plants. The farmer gets precise information where to water more or less and when and where fertilizer is needed. With the help of Galileo's positioning and navigation information, smart farming is made possible. Let's see what solutions our Copernicus and Galileo prize winners have come up with for agriculture and forestry. The first solution is coming from the winner of the Netherlands prize. My name is Tanne van der Wal and I'm the founder and CEO of Bioscope. Bioscope is a farmer owned startup transferring satellite data into useful information products that farmers can directly apply to their daily tasks and operations. When talking a lot to farmers, we learned that they are very happy with our great maps, but they can only see them in their offices while their work is out in the field. Investing in fancy electronic equipment is also not feasible for the average farmer. So we started discussing with farmers how we could make their life easier. We took their ideas back to the office and we started building a solution to make smart farming easier, affordable and accessible to all farmers. And this is the result, Field Scout. Our smart farming app puts satellite data into the pocket of the farmer. All our maps for daily tasks such as scouting, spraying, fertilizing and more are available on the smartphone. And using GNSS, farmers see themselves amid the satellite pixels so they can walk to the spots highlighted by the satellites where the crop needs attention. Our customers are very happy. With our smartphone app, they can now compare the field situation with the satellite maps and vice versa. They can make geotech notes and photos on the spot for later use. And the time slider let them go back in time to see how the crop evolved and when problems first started to be shown. And farmers don't need to invest in fancy electronics. They can first try out how smart farming and variable rate spraying can work out, thanks to our app. The sprayer boom is indicated on the screen, so with manual controls, farmers can take all the benefits from smart farming, farming without the huge investments. In this way, smart farming is not only easier, it's also more affordable. When farmers walk through the fields, they can find themselves in the satellite map and they can immediately link the satellite observations to the ground situation. In this way, they become much better aware of the crop health status and what the satellite adds to their own observation. For our customers, Field Scout is a great aid to make smart farming easier. They walk or drive directly to the spot in the field that needs their attention. Now, smart farming is easy and affordable thanks to Field Scout. Hello, my name is Celia and this is Eomedic. When I was a child, I spent every summer at my grandparents. There, the surroundings were dry as a bone step, cultivated here and there. The water came by a channel from a river, uh, which was 300 kilometers away. But only half of that precious irrigation water reached the destination. Evaporation and leaks were taking the rest. But then, the ground wasn't even uh, able to soak up those large amounts of water generously spread by the irrigation device. It's clear that today's agriculture remain stuck in the mindset of past where, where supplies of water were abundant and cheap. Farmers are overwatering their crop. They are losing extensive amount of precious irrigation water and have to put an extensive amount of fertilizer and other inputs. Smart irrigation could solve that issue, but it requires so sensors which are expensive, 
often get lost, stolen, or broken while plowing. Luckily, soil moisture can be measured from space. With EOMATIC, we provide simple and actionable soil notifications using Sentinel-2 data, soil type, and crop type. We use a model which provides 10 meter spatial resolution and can be up to 100 times better than the other models based on NDVI data. Today, we run our first trial with a large farm in South Africa. There, the agronomists use our soil maps daily to optimize their irrigation and find spots uh, which are over or under irrigated and prove that our model is precise. We are a team of two and today we are looking for partners uh, from companies in smart irrigation and earth observation. Why you should join us? Because we believe that earth observation data can help more farmers transition to more sustainable ways of farming using less water, less fertilizer and more good for the planet. I am Ilya, this is EOMedic, thank you. Hi there, my name is Nils and I'm one of the founders of uh, Digifarm and we're an ag tech startup based here in uh, Norway. And uh, my journey started back in 2018 um, in Hamar, Norway, where I was born and raised on a family farm and I'm now a 10th generation uh, crop producing farmer. And uh, at that point in 2018, we knew we wanted to uh, build some precision ag services. Uh, but the problem and the, uh, the current challenge at that point was the, we didn't have any accurate field boundaries. And in Norway, we're, uh, we're not part of the EU, so we don't have access to the CAP or the LIPS uh, program, which gives you uh, kind of some identification of parcels on arable land. So when we started this process in 2018, we saw that there was a challenge in having accurate field boundaries for, uh, for having precision ag services. So we started uh, looking at being able to use a super high resolution data set, orthophoto data set here in Norway at 0 0.25 meter resolution to build these deep neural network models for being able to automatically detect field boundaries and seeded acres. And we spent a lot of time doing this uh, well over a year where we trained several hundred models with different parameters. And we finally had our first results in August of this year. And we're, uh, we're proud to have, uh, we believe, some of the best field boundaries um, and, and the highest accuracy. So uh, the current uh, map that we've done with field boundaries for Norway has an intersection of UN of 0 0.94. And uh, what we're in the process of doing now is we're super resolving Sentinel-2, downscaling from 10 meters to 1.25 meters and injecting that into the field delineation model. And uh, this will help, of course, with the temporal resolution for the model and being able to have the highest accuracy of our uh, field boundaries. And the next step for us is we're rolling out to different regions. So we've just finished Norway and we're doing Australia and Canada right now. And then in um, this process, we will be also adding additional layers of uh, models. We have a crop detection model and a zoning product. And the zoning, of course, is kind of the, the holy grail for us, which will help farmers uh, reduce their input costs by uh, up to 10% and then increase their yield potential by up to 12% through variable rates of technology, specifically for variable rates of seeding and fertilizing. So hello, uh, my name is Roman Bohovic. I am from Work From Space from Czech Republic and uh, we invented Dr. Matt for this satellite driven soil moisture and soil assessment agriculture API. We did it together with uh, Matusz, who is our radar expert, me as a uh, earth observation expert and uh, Jan, who is our CEO and uh, also environmentalist and agri agriculture expert nowadays. We are working with, with uh, Satellite 1 and Satellite 2 data to avoid clouds. We are fusing uh, these two sensors and we are computing, am among others, soil moisture index, that is a relative measure of soil moisture in the near surface layer. We are preparing also soil type and uh, carbon content and uh, we are uh, planning for uh, adapting infiltration model into our uh, API. We have, uh, we offer field oriented uh, uh, services, assessment for the farmers and uh, the agriculture software uh, in general.
we uh, were running Dynacrop.space API and Dr. Matt is a product extension addressing soul properties and moisture condition. It's premium product for growers of high value crops and consultants. Uh, Dynacrop.space uh, is lightweight satellite API for agriculture in general. We are transferring multispectral and radar satellites information through the API to the end users and end customers. map is connecting forest owners to carbon market. Global forest cover is 4 billion hectares. Forestry market is 400 billion euros, supported with 35 billion euros of subsidies. We estimate that forest carbon market potential is 12 billion euros. 5 million hectares of forest is lost every year. There is not yet functional financial incentive for forest owners to maintain forest and improve its carbon and biodiversity balance. There is lack of end user data on how to increase economic value, carbon balance and biodiversity. Also, there is not yet high resolution and near real time global forest monitoring. Our satellite data forest modeling product will be in 20 square meter resolution. It will be near real time. The forest modeling and change monitoring will be based on open source satellite data, primarily Sentinel-2 images and Sentinel-1 radar. Accuracy of the forest model input parameters is increased with a stratified sample of high resolution satellite, airborne and ground data. The input data accuracy is validated with reference data. Scientific up-to-date forest carbon and biodiversity model is applied to the input data. Benefits include global awareness of forest assets, data-driven public and private carbon market and regulations, including improved valuation of natural forests and projected 2 to 3,000 euro revenue increase per hectare in 50 years of commercial forestry. Business model combines freemium with B2B map monitoring as a service. And most importantly, world's most credible carbon and biodiversity marketplace. Compared to our competitor, we will have better customer reach, data product quality and scientific credibility. Our pricing will be lower and our business model will be much more comprehensive. We have a highly technical team and we have been making revenue in the last two years. Also, we have secured revenue for 2021. So far, we have launched our Finnish carbon model and conducted global satellite data analysis. 2021, we will be developing and launching global forest carbon and biodiversity map and building our global customer, partner and research relationships. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all. I'm Manuel De Luque, CEO of Oscalia Technologies, and I'm very excited to participate representing the community of Madrid in this event so relevant to the development of European aerospace technology. Forests are increasingly value for the ecosystem services, environmental role, and public amenity. The European Union promotes sustainable forest management, which is crucial to ensure a productive and sustainable use of our forests for their conservation. The development of a management plan and other technical documents is the best way to ensure this responsible forest management, which always includes the mapping of trees the biodiversity. This point is as important as expensive and time consuming because it requires file inventories performed by a qualified professional. This high cost is one of the aspects that hinders the proper professional management of forest resources. Our SAT3 project aims to provide a technological service based on a predictive model to remotely determine and map three species, their density and distribution in forested areas. 
The model is calibrated using an specific and a spectral photometer developed by Boscalia, combined with the free, full, and open data of the Copernicus program. Specifically, the visible and near infrared multi spectral images from the ESA Sentinel 2 satellites were used. The service will allow to reduce the field work, increase the data quality, and expand the monitoring from punctual and local to continuous and regional spaces. Once the system is implemented, it's easy to carry out resampling and map updates. Today, the system is practically operative and ready to market for the Spanish sector, where we will begin to test in a short period of time. To continue, we are identifying the best way to finance the jump to other countries in Europe, implementing our solution for the three species of each country or region, and opening our market to the entire continent or eventually to the world. On behalf of all the team of Oscalia Technologies, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks to our winners for their great presentation and impressive solutions. Ladies, after hearing six solutions for agriculture and forestry, do you have a clear favorite solution in this thematic area? Candice, would you like to start? <laughs> yeah, sure. So to be very honest, the overriding uh, sentiment and feeling that I have is that um, I think we have great companies, but that they should, some of them should get together. Uh, because, you know, if I were a farmer and I had all of these possibilities to improve my crops or my soil or whatever, it would be very difficult for me to have to do, you know, contracts with four different companies. So I really, really um, should, uh, would like to say that I think some of these companies should get together. You should try and build scale because that's what's really, really important. Um, I heard only one company that was our forest company, Otsu, who talked about um, uh, who talked about revenue. Um, you know, all of these companies are very often just technology based, but they really, really need to be market oriented. They need to be commercial uh, successes um, in order to gain more investment. So I'm sorry to not be, you know, I, I, I see so many technology companies um, you know, I think I see about 100 space technology companies a week. But the most important thing is really scale, to be scalable, and to generate revenue so that you can survive. So that's my first thoughts. Thank you, Candice. So this uh, sounds a bit like you uh, preferred the solution of Otso, uh, Otso Walter from uh, Finland, I guess. So um, thanks a lot. Uli, um, is there a solution that sparks your eye when it comes to crowdfunding? So let me let me elaborate a little bit on what, what Candice said. And I saw a few proposals that actually have some really interesting and, and um, promising components. Um, so um, I heard from the, the, the first company, Field Scout, that they're really concerned about um, giving real-time data to the farmer while he is at the field on a device that is or that he is using anyways. I think that makes it easy to access, easy to hopefully easy to implement a low cost model, which is relevant in Europe um, and also in Africa, because there is many farmers that have comparably small field sizes. So that was exciting. I heard from one company, I believe it's Avion Map, um, that they have already first revenues. Um, that's a good starting point when starting to think about commercializing your ideas, um, because that's the proof that what you're doing is relevant to your potential customers. And from an investor perspective, uh, that is key to the success. Technology, impressive technology is one thing, and we see a lot of that. Um, to really be successful in the market to convince customers to pay for our product is the next challenge. And somebody who has started to prove that case is um, interesting from an investor perspective. And to that end, um, 
I, um, there, there were also um, uh, two other um, um, projects that were um, interesting and exciting. Um, the um, uh, the Digi Farm um, combining machine learning um, with Earth observation data, I believe, is really an upcoming opportunity with lots of um, business cases that might be attractive, and also business cases that can be used in partnering models with some of the large um, companies out there that already have the link to the customers. Um, and um, so, so, so all these aspects, um, thinking about what the customer really needs, having a product that is easy to use, um, having already revenues, um, are, are attractive from an investor perspective. Uh, and for crowdfunding, do you think there was one project which sparked your your eye, which came came up, and you thought this would be the project that I could do a crowdfunding campaign for? Um, so um, the, um, the 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 first one mentioned um, Field Scout and an Avian Map certainly um, higher up on the list of um, companies that that might be attractive for crowd investing. Thank you very much. Martina, having the European glasses on, which of the solution has the highest impact for Europe and its agricultural policy? Well, I think we have perhaps to distinguish um, two aspects. And I think that uh, the presentation of the pitch is uh, very nicely demonstrated these two aspects. We have on one side, as the first two uh, proposals, a very user-driven and user-concentrated objective uh, with uh, applying, um, uh, uh, offering a development, an application, which really is of use for an individual farmer. Um, I think this is very important. Um, this is also one of our objectives to make really very concretely examples what can space data deliver and that they have a real impact on individual users. We have on the other side, um, and these were perhaps the two last presentations, we have uh, projects which have a more broader uh, objective um, and in our view they are clearly directed towards the green deal objective so for example the carbon reduction so these i would say are the two main difference between uh, the pitches we saw um, i would say one category is as important as uh, the other um, so I have a preference, yes, for, I would say, for the first um, application, uh, which is really, as I said, again, very driven, very user driven. Um, and um, the Finnish proposal, yes, is uh, very interesting from the more global aspect. Thank you, Martina. Well, summing up what we just heard from the three of you, it seems that uh, the solution from Otso um, has two yeses. So one from Martina and one from Candice. Uli was very broad in her answer, so I don't think that she has made up her clear fa favorite for the first session at least. <laughs> so let's jump to the next thematic area of health and well-being. All of us learned the hard way this year that there is nothing more important than our health and um, safety. But how are we supposed to keep us healthy and happy in times of risks and limitations? Earth observation data can give us information about air quality and its pollution and therefore conclude on safe areas. Whereas we need Galileo, its accuracy and integrity to keep us safe while doing sports and leisure activities outside. I want you to think beyond your smartwatches and mobile phones that track your health and activity and dive into the new solutions of our next winners that support your health and well-being. Let's start with the winner of the Greece Prize. Ladies and gentlemen, 
My name is Kostantinos Kokolakis, and it is my honor to present your service called Sports for Visual Impairment to all sports for VMP. According to studies, the number of visual impaired people is constantly increasing because of the modern way of life. Today, there are around 250 million visual impaired people that are restricted to a degraded form of sensing sports. Specifically, they are limited to exploit only one sense. This audio description they receive is filtered through a commentator, thus it is vulnerable to subjectivity and delay the human factor being set. Other spectators exploit sight and hearing. This exact inequality leads to social exclusion. So what is the solution? The solution is to add the sense of touch. To do this, Sports for VAP has three main steps. The first is to capture the relative position of athletes or ball and their movement. To actualize this, we use Galileo and other GNSS-enabled wearables and an artificial intelligent camera tracking system for indoor sports. These special data are transferred with 4G or 5G to VAPs which is a tangible IoT device our team has designed and manufactured. VA Pins has a miniature of a field with a combination of tactile and acoustic stimulations that drives the user hand to follow the movement of the ball in real time. VA Pins is portable, has roughly the size of a normal tablet and can be used for multiple sports by changing only its upper part. My core team members are Georgos Deligiorgis and Georgos Kasiotis, whose main responsibility is the AI tracking system and VA Pins building respectively. Vasilis Vitorakis designed the final version of VAPINS while getting this sponsored us for a working VAPINS prototype that you can see being used by Mr. Francis, our beta tester and consultant. Our next step is to find investment and partnership with sport broadcasters and clubs in order to increase our production capabilities and offer this experience to more VAP. It is crucial for us to have business mentoring in order to maximize our potential and also to reach new market channels to globalize. Thank you for your attention. Android is developing a way of saving lives and optimizing patient outcome with utilizing Galileo in its AAA alert device. This will use anaphylaxis, of which there are currently over 200 million sufferers globally, and over 10 million of those already carry an auto injector with adrenaline in. Uh, with a value in the marketplace of about $2 billion and growing rapidly every year. AAA Alert ensures immediate medical backup, which is essential to prevent intensive care and over 2,000 unnecessary fatalities a year. The core of AAA Alert, of which we've got a patent pending, <clears throat> is GNSS to locate the patient and guide the first responders to administer the required medical backup and to prevent a second phase reaction. The device will also have GSM and RF capability to connect to SATCOM, such as Hylas or Iridium uh, for backup. This will enable two-way communication between the first responders and the patient uh, to give a definite location, details on such as room number, use a second injection now, expect the time of arrival of the first responders and so on. Rapid response to an anaphylactic incident improves the prognosis, reduces the possibility of fatalities and intensive care hospitalizations as patients can receive all the necessary backup in the emergency vehicle, an important consideration during the current pandemic. The AAA alert can be attached to all leading adrenaline auto injectors giving an all-in-one, automatic, accurate, reusable and cost-effective device with the benefit of reassurance for the patient that they will be effectively managed by healthcare professionals. <clears throat> Alraid aims to utilise business incubation at Altu, Helsinki, that's the university, and has already started communications regarding working partnerships with Altu and VTT in Helsinki. A prototype for field testing will be ready within six months <clears throat> and there is a financial requirement to raise working capital uh, of 150,000 euros for initial inventory, increase in personnel and launch in the first key market. During the fundraising, Adelaide will identify contract manufacturers for scaling up production and reducing unit costs. End of presentation. The growing population of recovered 
COVID-19 patients will need a helping hand to restore their health and resume their daily lives and work. That in cure is gradual walking and hiking on a rough terrain, well known from the mid of uh, 19th. The Rencure reinforced the cardiovascular system, stimulate breathing activity, and stressless muscles. Therefore, the Rencure now can be used for recovery after cardiovascular, respiratory, and muscular disorders caused by COVID infection. The rehabilitation begins in clinic with doctor's prescription it continue under permanent medical supervision. The monitoring doesn't stop when the patient realized from the clinic and shall continue remotely when the patient stays at home. Unfortunately, all conventional fitness apps aren't suitable for that. We created the Turing Cure app especially for those people who continue their fight for full life and work at home. For this purpose, our telehealth app includes the permanent medical <coughs> uh, remote supervision of patients' outdoor activities during the full rehabilitation period. Give to the doctor all necessary patient physiological data thanks to our innovative metrics, algorithm, and big data from clinical gray sensor of smartwatches and wearable gadgets. The possibility to choose only clean environments for the outdoor activities thanks to Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service and Climate Data. Precise road planning and navigation thanks to Galileo. Right now, we are ready to start using the Rencure IRL4 prototype for the rehabilitation of after COVID patients. We are looking for investment. And in the positive case, we will immediately purchase all necessary gadgets and we'll be ready to offer <coughs> the Rencure in clinics in Lithuania, Portugal, Israel, and Ukraine. Thanks to the three of you for your presentation. And I'm pretty sure that the coughing just came because they had to talk so much about their solution. Coming back to our experts for space technology and the space market, which of the solutions you just heard could rise and shine in this highly competitive market? Martina. Well, I would say that all three really merit a big breakthrough in the markets uh, because compared, for example, to the agricultural field where the use of space data is already rather advanced. Um, the health sector is still in a very, very infantile stage. So uh, I was very pleased when, when reading um, these proposals uh, because they, they really show that uh, in principle, there is no limit of the use of space data Galileo signals. Um, again, there is one, and I would say the first, um, which is really concentrated on specific needs of people. And um, this is what uh, I find very, very important. Uh, if I may say, um, it has also a very broad political background. E-inclusion is uh, since many years, one of the priorities of the commission. And uh, this is really a proposal which would perfectly fit into this frame. Um, the objective is, of course, to give people with special needs uh, the technological means to have a more normal life and to help them really in, in, their, daily, in their daily life. Thank you, Martina. Candice, do you have one that sparked your eye? Yes. <laughs> Uh, so actually, I, I am in agreement with Martina. Um, I think that the first one um, I kind of put here, which I thought was kind of fun, you know, it's kind of instead of an autonomous vehicle uh, for people, you know, it's, it's, it's an autonomous tracking uh, on the road for, um, for people. Um, it uses the same technology 
um, just on people instead of cars. So I very much uh, liked um, our friends, um, the sports VIP. Thank you, Candice. We have learned about solutions that are data driven and others that are specifically selling a certain product, which is m usually more suitable when setting up a crowdfunding campaign, Uli, and what do investors prefer? Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, that is really um, the question of what do crowd investors, so crowd investors prefer. And here we can see that um, investors currently really have started to understand that we have a number of big societal challenges and we need to innovate ourselves out of those challenges. There is not much alternative to that. And those challenges are in the area of health and safety, they're in the area of energy and sustainability, and they are in the area of digital. So health and safety is a big topic and the crowd investors look for concrete solutions. They want to see that a specific problem is being solved with a technical approach. So crowd investors today are not looking for business model innovations. They're really looking for technical innovation. And um, I actually, from a crowd investor perspective, there were two of those proposals, super interesting. Um, one is the last one, um, Terrain Cure, um, because it addresses a real obvious current, the most pressing current problem. And that's always something that crowd investors can relate to really well. Um, and um, the fact that uh, there's a solution that involves space data um, is very innovative. The other um, project that from a crowd investor perspective is interesting is AAA, uh, AAA Alert. Um, also because the amount of funding that's needed for the next stage of development is an amount that crowd investors can very easily provide. 150,000 to 200,000 euros is something that we raised from crowd investors within a month's time. So that would be attractive as well. Thank you, Uli. It's very interesting that you pinpointed down your comments on the last two solutions that we heard and that you did not mention something about the sports for VIP solution, which the other two ladies found very interesting. Is there a specific reason for it? Um, uh, no, it's, uh, it's also attractive and exciting for the reasons that were already mentioned. So I chose not to be repetitive. Thank you very much, Uli. So I would say uh, then we go to our next uh, topic and it was already uh, raised by uh, Candice since she compared it a little bit, um, the first solution spots for VIP with uh, mobility, transport and logistics. So we live in a very globalized world where mobility, transport and logistics do play a key role. But the problem that comes along with it is that the traffic increases and environmental pollution with it. Not to forget that all this infrastructure needs maintenance. With the help of GNSS and EO, we are able to offer intelligent traffic and logistic management, car sharing models, electromobility, as well as autonomous driving. Four of these year's winners have specific solutions that help to make transport and mobility cleaner, safer and cheaper in the long run. The first solution is coming from Austria. Greetings from Vienna. My name is Klaus Heilbuchen and I'm founder and CEO of IoT Basket. With our idea, we solved the problem that digital data is often poorly available on site during traffic events. And however, digitization would have enormous potential here in particular, for example, in form of traffic safety, for efficiency, or form of transparency. So our customers are mainly the public sector and infrastructure operators, and we are talking about a potential of more than 50,000 units a year, owned in our first target markets, Austria, Germany, and Sweden. Worldwide, there's currently only one actual competitor in Canada, so pretty far away. And um, let's go a bit more uh, in detail for our solution. IoT Base Plate is a mobile and modular IoT system consisting of hardware and software, data insights and services, um, especially for digital on-site data. So IG Bespit is extremely versatile. It can be easily integrated into a wide range of infrastructure elements, 
for example, in a K1 base plate, but also in warning sign trailers or traffic light houses. Um, on that, IG base plate allows you to quickly and easily detect signal and communicate data. And however, our goal is to develop not only a product or a hardware, but more a uh, full service for specific use cases. The next steps, we are for founding partners now with experience, network and a pretty good funding. So next year in 2021, we want to concentrate on our startup phase with prototyping, uh, pilot project and test fields. And in the following year in 2022, uh, we plan to enter the market with an initial focus on Germany, Benelux and Scandinavia. So therefore, we strongly are interested in support of business planning and marketing, projects and funding for further research and development, technology partners, and of course, strategic partners for international sales and services. So um, uh, two minutes with our GBS plates. Thank you very much. And greetings from Vienna. Goodbye. Congestion costs the European Union nearly 100 billion euros annually, yet the dependency on road transport will inevitably increase with a growing urbanization. So the question is, how can we accommodate the growing number of vehicles and enhance mobility, while at the same time reduce congestion and pollution? During one of our many fascinating lunch conversations with Stanford researchers, my friend and now colleague Alberto and I found that the answer to this was a transition to smart cities. This thriving and highly competitive new market gave us the opportunity of exploiting the futuristic technologies we were so interested in and that we were using in our research, such as artificial intelligence, data sharing, and Internet of Things, to revolutionize even everyday services we gave for granted, such as traffic lights, to make them faster and more efficient. Well, our solution supports this transition by providing intelligent traffic mapping, predictions, and management services through our smart platform. So to create a bridge between the automotive industry, road users, and public infrastructure. We're capable of doing this by combining the unique precision of Galileo positioning data, constantly shared by modern vehicles and smartphones, and road infrastructure signals, such as traffic light timing, to the power of cutting edge artificial intelligence. In fact, differently from current technologies and other proposed concepts that rely on the installment of cameras and sensors to locally estimate and manage traffic, by combining Galileo positioning data and artificial intelligence, we're capable of offering a flexible and optimized traffic monitoring and management solution to cities and private industry to map and reduce traffic throughout the whole urban road network without the necessity of new infrastructure. The solution also enables the implementation of active road safety strategies, such as accident detection or first aid and public transport prioritization. Finally, the collection and sharing of detailed traffic data and statistics will prove fundamental for governments and city planners for efficient policy making, resource allocation, and public transport optimization. We will develop this platform in 12 months, for which we shall require a team of expert programmers and will be financially supported by public and private investments, as well as incubation. A further 12 month testing phase will be conducted on our first selected pilot city, which will benefit from our innovative service for free to incentivize collaboration and promotion. This will allow us to launch our product by as soon as 2023, with all future service exp expansions to be implemented and tested directly on the market. Again, test cities will have these additional services for free. Our revenue streams will be from the platform license royalties to municipalities and public and private, as well as traffic statistics and prediction data sales. We're confident that our solution will, re will revolutionize urban mobility allowing future post-COVID cities to accommodate the inevitably growing number of vehicles, while at the same time reducing congestion and pollution and promoting road safety. And we hope to, have, to join our efforts in doing this. Thank you for your attention. In Europe, there are more than 4 million kilometers of roads and the maintenance costs about 50 billion euro per year. Only in Paris, there are about 45,000 potholes, and the methods to detect them are either not optimal or very expensive. We want to optimize the allocation of the maintenance budget and obtain the best possible overall quality of the roads. Our solution is to provide a map that shows all the defects of the road with their severity. Here is an example. The shown defects can be local like potholes, 
but warm road portions can be shown as well. Our target market includes in particular public institutions like municipalities that are in charge of maintaining the roads. We will help in reducing car maintenance costs and improve comfort so citizens will be more satisfied while driving. Let's see how it works. We put a measuring device in the car, a small box containing an accelerometer and Galileo positioning, or just a smartphone with a dedicated app. When the car moves into a pothole, the car quake is measured by the accelerometer and is sent with the position to a data center. This big amount of data is analyzed through artificial intelligence algorithm, and thanks to the Galileo accuracy, a precise map is automatically created. The nominal service is to sell the map, but an extension will be to directly propose a smart maintenance strategy. The competitive advantage of our idea is that we do not need dedicated cars to make the measurements. We will use a massive installation on already operating vehicles from the customer-owned fleet, for example. In this way, we will have continuous multiple measurements with several passages on the same roads for a reliable service. We made preliminary road measurements using a prototype with three axis accelerometer and GNSS receiver that confirms the feasibility. In this video, we show an example of a local defect measurement. We are currently contacting municipalities in order to collect market data. We plan to continue this activity in the next months. We would like to enter an ESA Big Business Incubator at the beginning of 2021 for further support. As soon as the business model is validated, we will look for investment in order to start the production for some measuring devices and cooperate with the first municipalities. Thank you for watching. We do hope you enjoy our idea as we do. Everybody, I'm happy to have the chance to present you our startup Dialytics. The street condition in Germany decreases continuously. Therefore, fixing street damages like cracks in a timely manner is of high importance for the civil engineering department. In order to reach this goal, the civil engineering department needs to have an overview about the condition of their street network. By providing a smartphone with our app installed, we enable our customers to do the street condition inspections by themselves on a regular basis. The customer installs the device in the windshield of municipal vehicles, such as street sweepers or cars, from the local government. Those vehicles already drive in the streets, and from now on, with every journey they do, they collect data, like image or vibration data. The data is then analyzed by our neural networks to find defects, such as cracks or potholes, fully automatically. We provide a data update every half a year to our customers and differentiate into 12 different damage classes in order to provide data which enables to take immediate action. This is really unrivaled. After the data evaluation, we deliver a web-based street map to our customers. As you can see here, we provide a street view where the street streets get grades according to a specific evaluation scheme. The state of the stream of the street is also indicated by color. Green stands for a good state and red stands for bad state. What's shown here on this slide is the filter for individual grades and damage classes. Herewith, I can filter for areas where surface renewal makes sense, because this maintenance work is very efficient. Here now I have filtered for areas with a grade worse than 2.5, and the filtering results are shown in the map. With this information, I can plan my maintenance work based on objective data. Before I come to my end, my presentation, I want to highlight our great team. Most of our guys could have jobs at Daimler or Porsche, but they really believe in our mission and want to have a real impact on the world. Thanks a lot. Thanks to all of you for your presentations. In mobility and transport, we do have different customers, but mostly they differ between public sector and private sector. In your eyes, Candice, who might be the preferred client of the solutions we just heard? Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm a free marketeer <laughs> uh, and I kind of believe that, you know, just about everything uh, should be done by private companies, except for maybe really, you know, deep R&D and, 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 and things like this, you know, if particularly if you have companies uh, like Vinci in, uh, in, in, in France and everything. Um, the 
um, you know, I think that the second company from Spain, um, so I think it was called Smart, um, I think that that particular company uh, would be very well used by municipal governments. Um, you know, to have and 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 so you need to have that type of mapping for the smart cities. So I would see um, uh, smart being the best company that would be having a public sector client. Um, I also happen to like them. Uh, and uh, I would urge, you know, I'm an American, so I'm a big market. I'm not only a free marketeer, but I'm a big market person. So I would really urge our two friends from France and Germany who are doing almost the same thing. You know, Franco-German uh, collaboration is very exciting and in these days. So, you know, I would really suggest that the two of them start talking and seeing if they can't do something together. Um, you know, maybe a little bit uh, difficult to say, okay, well, I'm the entrepreneur and you're the entrepreneur or the founding entrepreneur. But I seriously think um, we've got to get these companies together so that we can have a uh, scale. And the first company from Austria, I think, was very good for insur insurance companies. So insure tech. Candice, you already said it. Usually our space awards and this year, the first time the space pitches are the event to connect our innovators and um, to bring them together. So I hope that both of them will get in touch after this event. Uh, Martina, yeah. what is your opinion about the differentiation between the public sector and the private sector? Let me first uh, say that I fully agree with Candice. That was exactly my idea. Also, I would recommend the two last uh, starts up to work together. Um, infrastructure monitoring and infrastructure maintenance becomes an increasingly important uh, issue, even, even a problem. This is, of course, in Europe, in most cases, for, for the public uh, sector. Um, despite the fact that I fully agree with Candice, but I would also say um, it can make a difference for a public administration in case they could use one of these innovative applications. So I think that uh, the examples we, we saw um, have all the potential to make our, generally, our, our public sector much more efficient. Um, having said uh, this, there is a rather broad uh, future upcoming background concerning infrastructure monitoring. And this is independently, whether it be roads, gas pipelines, uh, dam monitoring, uh, due to the importance um, of uh, these problems, there will be even some specific calls in Horizon Europe, uh, which are asking for specific solutions to this. And I am very pleased to see that uh, from the space data side, in principle, we have very, very concrete examples already um, that could support the objective uh, of, of these uh, public and even global, global problem of, uh, as I said, infrastructure monitoring. Um, the first um, uh, proposal as well um, is very interesting and I also I agree with Candice to say it can be of uh, real interest for the uh, insurance sector. Thank you Martina. The solutions that have been presented offer on the one hand a product that delivers a solution for a specific problem. On the other hand we have solutions that offer a wider approach applicable to many problems. Uli, can you um, or can one quantify the value of uh, the different market approaches? Is it maybe better to have a niche product or a solution with a broad approach? Well, the best is to have a solution that can find customers. That is the starting and the end point to everything. And in, in my now almost 25 years as an investor in, in innovative companies, I have seen 
that it is sometimes more challenging for a technology that can solve actually 25 different problems because it's such a generic broad innovative technology such a broad platform that for these kind of technologies it's sometimes more difficult to find their relevant first customers their relevant first target market than it is for something that is more niche from the outset um, but since Customer is the ultimate goal. Customers is the best thing that can happen to any company, whether it's a young or an older company. It's actually the proof, um, the, con the confirmation that the assumptions are right. It's the most fun to, um, as an entrepreneur to find people that pay for what we're offering. It's, um, we get the best feedback from our customers as to what we have to improve and enhance. So to that end, um, um, even for broad platform technologies, the key is to define the niche that is maybe the easiest to, end, to, to, to access initially. And then scale can later happen with a, 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 um, a broader focus on other solutions. Thank you, Uli. So we heard that the European Commission is supporting uh, initiatives in the mobility, transport and logistics sector. And we also heard that customers are most important. So not only public, but also um, private ones. Um, let's jump to the next topic of our session today. Um, time is most crucial in emergency situations. Galileo delivers the most accurate timing signal and also ensures the necessary accuracy and integrity in critical situations. Next to natural disasters that destroy the land and ground infrastructure, there are also digital threats that affect our personal safety and security. Jamming and spoofing of satellite signals when an airplane is about to land or an autonomous vehicle is driven. Nobody wants to imagine what might happen if systems like these go, undergo interferences. Automatic area emergency safety and security will introduce you to solutions that keep us safe that help in emergency situations and that even have a solution for threats to our satellites in space. Let's start with the winner of the Hesse Prize. Welcome, we are Vioma and we build confidence in space. We will be protecting the space environment for future generations. So which problem are we tackling? We know that with the upcoming deployment of large constellations, the number of operational satellites will increase by one order of magnitude. The number of trackable debris is predicted then to explode to the millions. Right now, the world suffers from a lack of reliable space situational awareness, and because data is both inaccurate and infrequent, satellite owners have to maneuver often and necessarily. This maneuvering is expensive and leads to a significant reduction in satellite lifetime. Our solution to this problem is the Vioma Constellation. The Vioma Constellation is a satellite-based monitoring system that consists of 12 satellites. The advantage is that in space there are no weather-related limitations, which allows us to do 24-7 tracking. To localize the debris objects, we observe them using our onboard cameras. Based on the star background, it is possible to get relative positions. And eventually, with GNSS such as Galileo, we can determine their absolute positions. What is our unique selling point? Due to the innovative constellation design, we're capable of observing these objects with a very high frequency. Most of them even several times per day, and this is key for obtaining accurate position estimates. For our customers, for example, satellite operators and owners, this means that they don't need to maneuver unnecessarily. Therefore, we help them reducing mission downtimes. And at the same time, this means savings in cost and propellant. So together with our automated processing pipeline, we ensure a good night's rest for satellite operators. Where are we in our timeline? In spring 2019, the idea was born. By February 2020, we finalized the founding team, consisting of Luisa, Srinivas, Christoph, and myself, a team with a strong astrodynamics and engineering background. In July, we got selected for the AXIS grant and the ESA Business Incubation Center and officially registered Vioma. In September, we expanded our team with David and Maurizio, an astrodynamics specialist and a flight dynamics engineer. By spring next year, we want to offer our first software-based services, 
making use of already existing data and infrastructure, such that we can win a first pilot customer in summer 2021. Simultaneously, we want to progress on the constellation side with on-ground testing of the camera and in-orbit testing of the image extraction algorithm, putting us on the right track to launch demo satellites in autumn 2022 and deploy the full constellation by 2025, the dawn of a new age for satellite operations. With the support of the Galileo Masters Incubation Center, we are hoping to expand our team further and kickstart the camera procurement. Thank you. Everybody, uh, my name is Aleš Filip. I am a researcher at the University of Pardubice, Czech Republic. I have a question for you. Do you like to travel uh, by train as me? I believe so, because now I would like to introduce you a new idea how to adopt and certify the Aviation Agno Safety of Life Service for railway signaling, including the European Railway Traffic Management System, ERTMS. The uh, fundamental uh, requirement for EGNOS application in ERTMS is uh, that uh, this application must be certified according to railway safety standards. However, the problem is that uh, EGNOS safety case was developed for aviation and cannot be directly used for certification on a railway. So what is the solution? We propose to consider EGNOS as so-called pre-existing item according to relevant safety standards IEC 61508 and SENELEC EN 50129. The pre-existing item represents a new linking element between the aviation EGNOS safety case and railway safety standards. In this case, GNSS and railway stakeholders should only jointly develop so-called EGNOS safety manual for rail, describing safe uh, EGNOS integration with the ERTMS. This uh, highly qualified work should be coordinated on EU level. No EGNOS safety case for rail is then required. That wouldn't even be possible. It is the main advantage of the uh, idea. The EGNOS safety manual for rail will be then utilized for development of EGNOS of a safety case of the integrated railway solution based on EGNOS and for its subsequent certification. So uh, the uh, approach will enable uh, to replace uh, ERTMS track balises that are used for safe train position determination with a much uh, cheaper virtual balises detected by means of EGNOS on board of train. Operational cost of railway infrastructure can be thus significantly reduced. The idea opens the door to multi-billion business on European railway lines. Since EGNOS belongs to the SBAS family and different SBAS systems are used in different world regions, then the idea will also significantly support European GNSS and uh, railway industry on markets out of Europe. Thank you for your attention. For the introduction, in the last decade, the technological advancement led to the ever increasing popularity of UAVs. It is expected that the US, con US consumer market will reach $3.5 billion at the 2022. The vast majority of the UAVs are using GNSS for navigation and for more simple control. In the last years, UAVs have found their application in various areas. They can be used for counting pumpkin crops, delivering shipments, capturing the best holiday moments from high above. Unfortunately, unfortunately sometimes by accident or even by purpose, UAVs could cause harm. One of the mo most known incidents involving UAVs happened in December 2018 at the Gatwick Airport, when hundreds of flights were cancelled due to the drought sightings near the runaway. GNSS, one of the most amazing inventions of humankind, was used to break havoc. Scientists and industry are all around the world are working and looking for the best ways of neutralizing UAVs. 
there have been reports of trained eagles, net firing cannons, high power microwave weapons, and so on. But at the moment, the most popular solution is to use jamming devices, which transmit noise at GNSS and remote, con remote control frequencies, causing UA UAVs to land. Since those conventional systems are transmitting radiation at GNSS frequencies, they are unsafe for aircraft in the area of radiation. Contrary to the, those systems, our solution does not radi radiate signals in the GNSS frequency band. Our proposed solution exploits nonlinear properties of semiconductor elements in the target's electronic circuits. So how does that work? Let's imagine we have two generators. One of them generates electromagnetic signals and at 5.2 gigahertz and the other at 7 gigahertz. When those two signals reach target's electronic circuit due to nonlinear effect, additional signals are generated. In our case, those, this additional generated frequency will be at 1.2 gigahertz. And then this newly generated signal will couple into the GNSS receiver and interfere with actual signals of GNSS and uh, causing jamming. Since we're using high, higher frequency radiation, it can be focused into the much narrower beam or even cross beam approach can be applied to a spatially select target. At the moment, our solution have, re have reached TRL4 we have already submitted patent application. We hope that scientific paper will be published in the first quarter next year. And at the moment, we are looking for the incubation services and investments to further increase technology, technology readiness level. Thank you for your attention. Climate related disaster, like floods, storms, droughts and heat waves have been on the rise worldwide. For insurance covering crop damages produced by natural disasters, the claim management process is difficult because of the precarious nature of incidents. Claims should be settled within three months from their reporting and often insurance companies should rely only on proof of loss filled by the insured. This may give the opportunity for some individuals or organizations to file claims that are either inflated or completely fabricated in order to profit. On this regard, about 9% of the total claims are deemed as dubious, but only between 1% and 2% are investigated for fraud. Every year, 2.5 billion of fraudulent claims are detected. But at the same time, it is estimated that 30 billion is the amount of the non-detected fraud. Hyperion can solve most of these problems by combining Earth observation, meteorological data, and artificial intelligence. Hyperion is a software as a service providing a set of instruments to accurately estimate the damages produced by natural disasters. In particular, Hyperion takes advantage of Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and Metasat data to estimate damages produced by air storms, floodings, wildfires, and droughts. The development of Hyperion is partially financed by ESA, Business Application and Space Solution, and we are looking for seed funding in order to launch the product in early 2022 and access the North American market in 2023. We are in the middle of our event today and you've heard solutions that are at different development stages. Some are ideas coming from universities, others are coming from already established startups and even companies. Martina, putting on the European glasses, which instrument does the European Union offer for academia and young entrepreneurs to accelerate and finance their businesses? And what would your personal recommendation be for our winners as their next step? The Commission has uh, set up during the last years a couple of, of instruments um, to support exactly startup or young people who have promising ideas. Uh, particularly having in mind the different stages of their development. Um, we have these actions uh, grouped into the Copernicus Startup uh, Initiative and uh, giving a, a, an example, uh, the Copernicus Hackathons are typically the competition which is addressed to young people, to students, 
um, to young researchers who have an idea and uh, around these uh, competition, which is a bit limited around the weekend, can develop um, their uh, ideas. We have then gradually developed, as I said, uh, the initiatives always looking at the stage of development. We have, uh, of course, this is uh, part of today's evening, the Copernicus uh, prizes. We have the Copernicus Accelerator Program, uh, which is a specific tailor-made coaching program, of course, for starts up, which have already reached a certain level of uh, maturity. And uh, the latest program the Commission had set up is the Copernicus uh, Incubation Program. This is uh, the program which is really already dedicated to starts up, which have even made their first market uh, experience. Um, nevertheless, um, the Commission is, uh, of course, thinking about um, new, a new structure of um, a, a startup program. And uh, certainly the experience we made during the last years with all the amazing proposals we, we saw, we achieved, um, it is clear, and this is of course the very positive uh, aspect that, let me say, the startup landscape in general, the startup landscape uh, in, in space, developed really incredibly well. Um, in all kinds of aspects, the ideas which are presented, and I think today again is, is proof for, for this, the te technological development, but also the market orientation is much stronger than uh, I would say four or five years ago. So taking all into consideration, um, there will be new initiative, but uh, please uh, accept that I do not go into details uh, today because uh, our commissioner will in his opening speech tomorrow at the, the award ceremony uh, announce some um, interesting, very interesting news. So um, please feel invited to, uh, to participate and to listen to his speech. Thank you very much, Martina. We are curious for, uh, for his speech tomorrow then. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> So um, when it comes to financing business cases, is there an either or decision for public or private funding, Uli, or do you think both can be connected as we heard today already several times that also solutions can be connected. So why not connect public and private funding? Actually, indeed, um, in as they should be connected, it is most relevant um, for, for companies in particular for startups to think about um, where they are in their development, what kind of funding sources are available to them and what it means for the development of their business. Um, public funding sources are very often really, really suitable for the very early stages when there is still substantial technology risk. Um, if public funding comes in form of grants, it's very attractive because there is no payback. You don't have to give away shares of your company. You have no investors, neither supporting, but also no investors influencing the company. So brands are for very early stages, attractive means to build the business. Um, and then um, there is depending on where we, where we are as a business, um, the opportunity to find private investors through crowd investing, through online platforms, there is the opportunity to find business angel investors that potentially really know the areas they invest in really well and can provide a very operational level of support to the companies they invest in. For later stages, there is venture capital investors available. There is bank financing in many European um, countries nowadays that is also attractive because sometimes it comes along with government um, guarantees to the bank. So um, in that case, bank finance, finance and bank funding is more available to younger companies currently than it was in the past. So there's many sources and a well-funded company combines those sources with each other. We have actually a lot of companies that 
um, look for venture funding and combine venture and grant funding. And we help a lot of companies raise money from the crowd that, um, that have co-investors that are business angel or public investors and combine this and it works really well. Thank you, Uli. Candice, what is your experience in a combination of public and private funding? First of all, I subscribe to everything that uh, Uli just said, and I am very curious <laughs> to hear the, the announcement of tomorrow. Um, the, you know, basically, private investors, you know, they usually invest when the R and D phase is over. And so the, 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 the public, I, I, as I say, I am a free marketeer, but I definitely believe that public money should be spent for, for R and D because it's too risky. You know, people forget that private investors and in particular private individuals, you know, are investing their very, very hard earned money into companies. Um, and they need to have a return on investment. This is something a lot of people forget about. You know, if you have worked 30 years very hard and you have a little nest egg and you want to do some investment, first of all, I always tell everybody you better make certain that you can lose it. But even so, you know, the goal is to get a return on your investment. I like, I like the combination of private and public funding but I always say that it is the private investment that must lead. So, and by the way, it's not private funding, it's private investment. Um, so I think that increasingly where there is a need to do a lot of investment in R&D, uh, the public money is great for that. Uh, in particular, I like now the, the, the recent um, development by the EIB. Uh, we've seen them now. Uh, they, they announced last year that they were excited about getting into, you know, new space and investing in new space. And I have at least two companies now who have received sizable 15 and 20 million euro debt arrangements from the EIB, which are very um, advantageous. Um, so this is exciting that, that we can have debt uh, from public sources and then we can combine that uh, with private investment where the investor and of course the entrepreneur should get a return on the investment for the wonderful service, product, infrastructure that they are bringing to the world to make it a better place. Thank you very much, Candice. Um, to sum it up, I think that our winners that presented today and still will present um, have learned a lot in the last few minutes already about what uh, about their next steps, actually. So um, getting private investment, but also public funding through projects and programs of the European Union. And I'm sure they will also be curious what um, Commissioner Breton will, will tell us tomorrow. Coming back to our next thematic area, we are now um, at the topic of drones and robotics. The market for drones is currently worth uh, 22.5 billion US dollar and is supposed to double by 2025. So we do see there is a lot of potential behind it. Artificial intelligence, machine learning and IoT help humans in their daily work and therefore reduce costs, increase safety and reduce the risk of a system failure. This is again especially important in the area of infrastructure where time is not only money. The surveillance via drones and execution of tasks with robots using space data increases the quality and safety of all our lives. Let's see what solutions our winners have come up with under this thematic area. We start with the winner of the Bavaria Prize. Thanks we care about trash, especially small trash on grass and gravel. 
If you look at asphalted surfaces and streets, conventional cleaning machines lead to pretty good results. On the other hand, grass and other heterogen surfaces are, cannot be cleaned with these uh, cleaning machines. This is because if you use these machines on these surfaces, you would probably damage the surface. But a bigger problem is also that small trash, such as cigarettes and bottle caps, are left behind. As a result, these surfaces are still clean manually up until today. That's why we want to fundamentally change the way grass and gravel are cleaned by providing the world's first autonomous trash picking robot. The robot is able to navigate autonomously on a user-defined area. A small camera inside the robot is able to detect and localize small trash items on the grass surface. And once small trash such as cigarettes are detected, they are autonomously removed by the robot and uh, stored safely in the storage. Localization is essential for our robot as we operate in open terrain. So we use a vision-based obstacle avoidance to operate on these surfaces. In addition, we have used GNSS and RTK technology to localize ourselves on the terrain we use. Last but not least, we have a, a sensor fusion on board that allows us to also be safely operating even if we lose the signal. Only through this autonomy solution, we are able to provide the value that we do to our customers. We are Anxa Robotics and we make the world a little bit cleaner. Thank you. With new technology and new companies reopening the space race, space is once again the new frontier. In the next few years, we'll see a rapid increase in the number of communication satellites, and that will require a mass deployment of ground segment antennas here on Earth. And for these ground segment antennas, a lot of testing is required both for R&D, for manufacturing, and for uh, introducing new antenna models to the market. And that's a bottleneck for the industry because it requires antennas to be transported to test facilities every time they need to be tested. And that's expensive, it's time consuming, and it's logistically heavy. Quatsa wants to solve that problem because we have created a solution that makes it no longer necessary to take antennas and transport them to test facilities every time they need to be tested. We have created a solution that can bring the test facility to the antennas. The solution works as a drone integrated with our uh, customly developed RF payload and software that automates the whole process. So flight, measurement and data processing is automated. GNSS positioning is vital to this system because we need to know exactly where the drone is during the flight so that we can make these measurements. And further, GNSS positioning makes our system truly location independent because it means that we can go anywhere in the world and test antennas operating in the most uh, remote uh, regions of the world. Our company was founded in 2017 by our two founders who met at university and actually studied this uh, method together. In 2019, we had our first commercial assignment with one of the world's leading satellite operators and since then, we've been working on developing the technology with key industry actors such as ESA. And to support that, we have raised a pre-series A round of investment of 2 million euros here in August of 2020. The way our product works today is that we come out and perform the measurement for our customers. But in March 2021, we'll launch the product version of our, of our product meaning that people can actually start buying our system. So that's customers like satellite operators, like antenna manufacturers or service providers. And for that, we're now continually engaging with the industry to lay the foundation for a successful product launch. In October of 2021, we aim at raising a uh, Series A round of investment to further increase scaling and allow more and more actors to get improved access to test, antenna test data uh, in the industry. Thank you for that. Um, dear all, thanks to be here. I'm here to present Jude, your agricultural helper. In this project, we started from the main problem in agriculture. There are 56% of accidents that are caused by uh, overturning of tractors. A revenue that does not cover the cost, so it's agriculture today is not sustainable the new CO2 emission standard, and the lack of competent technical staff. 
the youth will gonna bring a solution of all these because the operator will gonna be far from the robot in a safety position. We will gonna have a 30% of cuts uh, saving uh, on saving on ordinary maintenance cost in the field. It's ready for stage five and is easily programmable. But what is DUT? DUT is an autonomous crawled robot that will interact with the environment that surrounds him. Thanks to, uh, it will gonna be lead at the beginning from the Galileo point, a set of Galileo point, and after it will gonna interact with the surrounding environment through its artificial intelligence. This will gonna allow um, uh, to make agriculture more sustainable with less compacting of the soil, an increase of safety, and there are around 700 euro savings per hectare. That is a quite huge impact on the balance sheet of, uh, of uh, agricultural company. The, the jute has an autonomy of 10 hours and is equipped with uh, an engine 75 horsepower that can uh, uh, move the soil. If you have any curiosity, visit our website or contact us for further information. So at info at artautomations.com. Thanks all to hear us, to hear me, and uh, follow, we're gonna follow a video, a short video of the machine in action. Thanks a lot. Drone project tries to improve the maintenance problems of large structures using the new UAV technology. Large structures have continuous maintenance requirements during its life cycle. Inspection tasks are a very key part of the maintenance process. These tasks are dangerous and expensive. Nowadays, UAVs are used for remote sensing inspections. They use digital cameras to check cracks and other pathologies of the structures. However, some of the inspections like ultrasound or resistivity measurements require contact and the current UAV technology does not allow it. Contact drone solution consists on a smart payload that allows the UAV to perform contact inspection tasks. Contact drone is usable with different contact sensors, such as ultrasound or resistivity sensors. Contact drone is a disruptive technology that can revolutionize the industrial inspection sector for large structures. The contact drone project has been already tested in laboratory and outdoor environments. Development stage is on TRL5. Contact drone was developed during three years at the University of Vigo and now is being developed in Oman, Galicia. Oman, Galicia is a spin-off from the University of Vigo. It's a company with highly qualified staff and all the knowledge from the University of Vigo. The project needs financial support to end the development of the system and introduce it in the market. Thanks all of you for your presentations. All these solutions that have been presented clearly show a need for Galileo and its accuracy. But which of the ideas do you think needs the highest accuracy possible? And which solution uses the advantages of Galileo best and why? Candice, would you like to answer? <laughs> That's a tough one because I think all of the um, solutions are indeed tailor-made to take advantage of the Galileo precision. Um, the, you know, the, 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 they, all, they, they all need it. They, they really, really do. Um, I know Quadsat uh, from uh, Seraphim Space Camp 
Um, uh, they are doing excellent work. Um, I loved the trash remo the trash removal. Probably it's the one that maybe has the least need for the precision, but um, it's great and I wouldn't mind having one for my own. Um, the, um, the, the maritime, uh, the maintenance on the large infrastructure, you know, it, it is critical because everybody in the world, every government in the world will tell you and every insurance company will tell you that our infrastructure is at great risk. Um, so this would be highly, um, highly beneficial. So I really have to say, though, I think all of the companies that were, you know, that won uh, really are using the, the precision of, of Galileo. Thank you, Candice. So is your favorite solution the Bavarian one, the trash picking robot? Did <laughs> I hear that right? <laughs> Yeah, that's my, my favorite personal one. You know, I'd like to have it for myself. <laughs> that's good to hear. Well, um, let's see what the other ladies uh, think of the solutions that have just been presented and if they also have a favorite one. Um, Martina. These uh, presentations were particularly interesting. You grouped them very well around uh, this theme, but they show how different in how different ways you can you can use um, Galileo and uh, when you look exactly what uh, Candy said also to um, to AXA robot, robotics and uh, then looking at the last one it's it's really an incredible range both of them all of them but these particular just to 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 mark the the two uh, the two sides um, have um, really really the potential to make differences the first one as i have said also at the very beginning is very concrete uh, in principle everyone can see and understand the uh, the advantages um, the last one is exactly in uh, the context of uh, what I had tried to explain um, a bit earlier, um, the critical issue of uh, maintain, maintaining and monitoring uh, big infrastructures. Uh, and this proposal is again one of the proofs that from, from the space side, um, there are already very, very concrete applications which can very concretely contribute um, to um, solutions which have, uh, as I said, also in the light of, of Horizon uh, Europe, a really future-oriented um, outlook. Thank you, Martina. Looking back at the immense market potential of drones and robotics, um, Uli, which is your favorite solution and which has, yeah, the highest market potential? That's actually super difficult to say. Um, in regards to um, in, in regards to market potential, um, I, I can see that antenna testing is going to become a real topic because we need more. Um, we need more practical and real-time capabilities there um, with all of the potential activities in regards to IoT and um, 5G um, and everything that is related to antenna testing. I think there is a huge potential. At the same time, I have to agree, I like the, um, the AMSA robotics because that seems to be something that can scale really easily um, and it's it's relevant and applicable in so many situations. Um, it's exciting that the more we encourage people to think about what can be done with really precise location-based information, we get more and more really exciting business opportunities to review and look at. And I think we're not by far not at the end of um, the scope of what is potentially possible and what might be attractive business cases. 
Thank you, Uli. And you say it. Um, we are doing the Galileo Masters in 16 years now. And um, we are hoping that uh, definitely for the next few years, we are also doing the Galileo Masters since there are still so many great ideas that we want to learn about. Um, jumping to our next topic. Um, yeah, with uh, Christmas coming up and the nights getting longer and darker every day, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, what we all need is energy, electricity and heating. These services are most vulnerable and a failure to provide energy can cause a disaster. I just want to remind those of you that have read it on the famous book Blackout. To prevent that, Earth Observation together with Galileo can secure the generation of energy and the proper working of our grids and pipelines by localizing damages in time. This saves money and time, but also puts sustainability, security and environmental awareness first. I'm looking forward to see what solutions our winners in this area have come up with. We will start with the winner of the Galileo Sweden Prize. Good morning, I'm uh, Ricardo Marchetto, the founder of Cosmic, a new startup company focusing on uh, water leaks detection using uh, a cosmic ray technology. The problem is the, uh, the water uh, loss along the pipeline between the aqueduct and the final user that more or less is about 30-35% uh, uh, along all the world. There are many solutions, uh, standard solutions from acoustic uh, to uh, other methods to find it, but it is uh, very difficult because the pipe is in the subsoil, so it's not visible to, to, uh, to, check, uh, to check it. Our idea is to use the cosmic ray coming from space, the neutron of cosmic rays, because neutrons are absorbed by uh, the hydrogen. So where there is a bigger quantity of water, like a uh, water leaks, uh, there is a, a very high quantity of uh, hydrogen that can absorb the neutron count, the, the neutron. So we create a device uh, uh, using a Galileo uh, receiver, a CPU and a neutron sensor that uh, it can run along the pipeline and check uh, uh, if there is a water leak counting the, the neutron. Um, a similar uh, device, uh, similar instruments is uh, in the TGO, the, the ExoMars uh, Trace Gas Orbiter around Mars to found not obviously not water leaks, but uh, the presence of water in the subsoil of uh, Mars. Uh, our um, technology is in a TRL-7, okay, now we are testing it uh, in a more 3,000 kilometers uh, along uh, Italy. And uh, at the end, we have a, a very big, big uh, data analysis uh, that we implemented a uh, artificial intelligence algorithm to uh, find uh, um, autonomously the, the data and send the, the, the problem, the water leaks found it directly to the customer. Uh, uh, we are a team of uh, seven people. Uh, we have an uh, engineer, uh, GIS specialist, project manager, health observation specialist, and obviously, obviously uh, water leaks uh, detection. Uh, thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is August, and uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the startup Tradewind. Today I will talk about how Tradewind can help your company make better decisions when investing or managing renewable assets. Renewable energy is amazing, but it is incredibly difficult. To do well, stakeholders have to accurately predict performance of production units based in unstable weather and for the next 20 to 30 years. To make matters worse, the energy market is one of the most volatile financial market this year alone, we saw prices of minus 54 euros and plus 144 euros. When renewable energy does not produce reliably and prices are so quickly changing, our stakeholders face significant risk and uncertainty in their profitability. For this problem, data is king. As an example, PVC estimated that including Copernicus weather data in decision-making could increase profits in the wind industry in Europe alone 
for 350 million euros each year. But collecting the data, setting up the forecasting models, developing the feasibility study, risk evaluating, it's all time consuming. And it's often not the core task of our stakeholders. At Tradewind, we provide a solution. At Tradewind, we do all the necessary groundwork. We collect the data, we do state-of-the-art power model forecasting and deliver a number of services. With that, customers can include both satellite data and much more effortly into their decision-making and reap the benefits. We also provide consulting to bridge the knowledge gap, knowledge gap for our users and ease the implementation so our users can get right into working. We make this available on our online platform, featuring easy to use and suitable tools for decision making, but also API services for long term software solutions. This solution is convenient. It's everything you need gathered in one place, but it's also efficient. We have made preliminary studies from real customers that suggest we cost one fifth of the normal forecasting price and more importantly, we use one fifteenth of the price of the time, so we can make our customers work faster and better. Thank you very much. My name is Ignacio Queiro. I am from Wittelapa Wittelapa company from Spain, and here I am here to present a Trendship, which is a project that uh, it's. Uh, related to uh, civil work engineering works that uh, are engaged in finding pipes, locating pipes underground. There is uh, the, the problem nowadays is that uh, there are no precise indications, no clues on how to find a pipe when there is some uh, uh, work to be done in the streets. And uh, people need to open the, the streets to dig a hole and sometimes this poses a problem because uh, if you don't find the pipe, you can this can cause time consuming, this can cause uh, extra cost and, uh, and, and personal damage even if you uh, if you dig the improper pipe. So uh, in order to avoid such such a problem, what we've uh, proposed, what, what we have in this product is uh, a sensor, a device that you can put on the on top of the pipe and when it's covered, then it's accessible uh, from outside this, uh, the upper side of the street. The solution consists of uh, a hardware and software combination. So that's a, a chip that is put on the pipe. Uh, you can put several several chips uh, across the pipe in junctions on some uh, uh, curves, 90 degrees curves, etc. The important thing is to locate it with a reader because this will once cover it from outside, there is a reader that uses RFID technology with our antennas, patented antennas, together with Galileo, that helps you to position around the, where there is the RFID chip. So in the combination of uh, satellite precise positioning and RFID, you can get good access to the point where you need it exactly to dig uh, a hole in order to find the pipes underground. So our solution also includes a software, uh, which is an uh, APP. Uh, there is a cloud uh, database. And there is an algorithm that states in the APP as well. And um, we have some examples of the software, uh, of the software and hardware application running. So how to use the the power the the Galileo algorithm that we implemented together with our uh, reader. That helps you to well, by reducing some ionospheric problems, the propagation, and uh, the ways of the dual of the different frequencies of the bands of Galileo GPS. We combine all the maximum satellites as possible together with these algorithms that reduces these errors in order to position you around one meter, fifty centimeters on the on the around the area, and by using the RFID, you get exactly then positioned by error of few millimeters. So uh, both both systems combined provide us a good solution that uh, already are used for Trendship, and we hope I hope that you really like this solution and I encourage to to go as further together. Thank you very much. Offshore wind is going to become one of the pillars of future energy generation. Unfortunately, installing offshore wind farms comes with a huge price tag. Relative motions between components lead to costly delays and project risk, 
rendering the installation process tedious, dangerous, and enormously difficult to predict. We are Flucto, and we have a solution. Based on previous research, we are developing a product that aims at accelerating the installation of offshore wind farms. Using our Galileo-based installation monitoring system, we enable installers to monitor, predict, and document offshore wind farm installations. Our product consists of multiple Galileo-enabled sensor devices and a central offshore server. Modern data fusion algorithms serve as a basis for offshore personnel to take smart decisions fast. For engineers ashore, we provide a cloud service that will enable them to do dynamic installation planning, thus mitigating project risk and reducing the price tag on green electricity. Next year, we will bring our installation monitoring system to market. And we want to get a first customer, a wind farm operator who uses our product. In terms of finance and growing the business, we intend to join a business incubation center. Then in 2022, we want to expand our product to offer a software for installation planning. We want to sell our product to five offshore, pro offshore projects. And we want to get venture capital, raise a series A to grow our team. Thanks to our winners for the presentations. Candice, you already mentioned that um, you liked Angsa Robotics and the trash picking robot. So is there also a favorite solution in this um, thematic area? Maybe the cosmic ray that could find water leakages in your garden? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think that, um, that that is certainly a very interesting you know, technology that shows and, and a company that shows the benefits of having this, you know, publicly funded deep R&D. So, and, and then bringing it back home onto earth. You know, when we did, when we went to the moon, even if we hadn't really put foot on the moon, the the technology that was developed be it you know the mobile phones be it the gore-tex um uh, material you know thousands of, of of new technologies that were developed in order for us to go to the moon but then really affected our lives here and so you know having this cosmic ray uh water um you know, leak uh, detection <clears throat> technology that is coming from our uh, our travel now to to Mars um, is is exciting. It, this is um, you know this is a real uh, you know showcase of why we do go to the moon and why we do go to Mars to help us take care of Mothership Earth. Do you think there was a specific solution that you just heard that combined Galileo and Copernicus in an outstanding way, Candice? Well, um, oh, the, that combined the Galileo and the Copernicus. Um, I, um, I, I, I think that the the wind turbine um, uh, companies, you know, both Flucto. And and trade wind um, did a good job of combining uh, that data to make practical use uh, for us in energy uh, and uh, making it more um, well in, in in renewable energy and making it uh, more affordable to more you know people around the world. Thank you, Martina. Um, I know that the European Commission, they set up the programs aligned and a combination of Galileo and Copernicus is somehow also the approach. Um, do you think that there was a solution that specifically pointed out uh, the combination of both? 
I would agree with uh, with with Candice, but um, indeed I would like to to highlight what you said uh, that it is really uh, the objective of the Commission to to foster the alignment, the coherence, and the synergetic use of uh, of the the different uh, space programs. And um, I think we we saw it already to today. Um, there are there is a growing number of uh, of projects who combine Galileo and um, uh, Copernicus. Of course, then adding all the new technologies like uh, intelligent artificial intelligence, uh, data mining, and so on. So um, again, if you allow me to compare uh, the projects with the ones we uh, received uh, four or five years ago. Um, there is a real, real trend in making use of uh, all available uh, space uh, data and, and, and signals. But if I may add, um, what I find interesting um, in this session, there is, uh, in my view, a growing number of uh, projects looking at infrastructures, pipeline, pipelines from very different angles. Um, however, I uh, would really like to, to encourage uh, the starts up to, to contact each other and coming back to, to what has Candy said at the very beginning. I think we should also take uh, this session and particularly you, the, the starts up, um, to network and to, to join your forces, because for me in particular in, in this area, infrastructure monitoring of infrastructures and pipelines, um, spontaneously I would see uh, many, many synergies between the, the projects uh, which had presented so far. Thank you, Martina. Specifically staying with you, I know that there are specific um, energy investment funds coming from the European Union. Um, would the candidates that we heard today be able to profit from those? And what are the programs that uh, you have? I must say I'm not an expert in, uh, in, in these energy programs. Uh, there are, of course, in principle, all big uh, European uh, programs from the coherent, cohesion funds, the regional funds, uh, but also, and this might be of interest, uh, the European Investment Bank um, finances energy projects. Um, um, but certainly also, and it might be of interest for one or the other to have a look at the Green Deal call, uh, which is published. Uh, of course, uh, the conditions to participate um, are not, uh, not easy. Nevertheless, I would really encourage you to, to have a look uh, because uh, there are also specific calls in um, which would require um, the knowledge and uh, the solutions you have already um, developed. Thanks, Martina. Uli, do you see a business case that is clearly scalable and that could profit from investment enormously? Yeah, I do see actually more than one business case um, in this group. And let me explain why. Um, actually, the, the real big question for many companies is, to which degree their solution has a positive impact on the value chain of their customer. And um, the, there, the, the, the question is relevant because the, the, the more important my proposed solution is for my customer, the more relevance it has to their value chain, the more likely that they really will spend time and money on what I'm proposing. And um, to that end, um, two, at least two of the proposals um, um, are really relevant. Um, and these are the two ones that deal with the um, wind energy. Because in actually um, in, in all of the renewable energies um, um, in regards to trade wind, actually the load balancing um, and the prediction of upcoming load is super important and super relevant. So um, they really have something um, where they answer questions that customers are really, really, really worried about. And that's, that's good for business. And um, in regards to offshore wind, um, Flapto, indeed, um, wind is moving offshore. It's, it's moving also 
further uh, and, uh, and offshore, not only um, a few hundred meters offshore, but it's moving more and more to deeper and deeper um, areas. And there the challenges to actually install wind farms is um, much bigger than closer uh, to shore. So it is actually indeed a real problem that Flacto is solving with the support to install offshore wind parks. And uh, yeah, so for um, potential investors, those two proposals are really interesting. Thank you, Uli, and also thanks to Martina and Candice. Uli and Martina already mentioned it, um, the Green Deal. Uh, so we are coming to our last um, topic. Uh, the Green Deal and the United Nations Sustainable Development already proved it that, of course, it has become more popular in the recent years. Clearly, climate change is real and natural disasters have doubled since uh, the past 20 years. Earth Observation is able to recognize problems and, more importantly, to monitor areas over a certain time span. This ultimately helps us in predicting future situations but only if we know how to work with the data. With all Sentinels up in orbit, we have massive amounts of data that first needs to be filtered. The challenge is to do this fast and customer oriented. Automation, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, machine learning can all help de um, to deliver the information just in time so that action can be derived. Our last session is looking into solutions improving our environment and climate and simply the use of EU space data for users. The first winner presenting under the topic of environment and climate is from the region of Catalonia. Uh, good afternoon to attendees all over the planet Earth. I'm Milena Rondini. I'm founder and CEO of Thinkerers. We are a geospatial intelligence and urban computer company founded by three women with a great multidisciplinary team with the passion for science and technology. And today we are presenting Hatton Platform. In the big data area, organizations cannot lose critical time interpreting huge amount of complex data and graphics. Can you imagine a deep tech tool that process data more efficiently and get fast responses to most of the greatest challenges of our time? like the increasing of natural disaster causes almost 90% by climate change or helps to create better cities for their habitats, Thinkers has created a revolutionary platform that allows us to face these challenges, changing the way we use geospatial data, a tool for organizations which need a useful tool to plan, monitoring, prevent or for citizen safety, avoiding, for example, communication problems in multidisciplinary teams. Atom is our solution, an Earth digital twin that combines disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence, mixed and virtual reality, IoT, computer vision, Earth observation or GNNS that allows us to translate in a visual concept and create analytics for predictive models or to process real time such as traffic or weather. Atom is an all-in-one platform that bit that centralizes all data sources in a single platform where you can visualize all data, even data of IoT sensors that give us available information that help us to save lives, natural resources, infrastructures, and reduce time and cost. Hatom also gives us ubiquity capacity through mixed reality devices. Even we can work anytime, everywhere, visualize multiple layers simultaneously, even in real time. Regarding risk prevention, for each euro invested, 15 can be saved, according to United Nations, European Commission or World Bank. So let's invest in innovative prevention tools like Hatom that can increase the efficiency of decision-making by 30%. And why 3D physical model? 3D is much more realistic than 2D data and simplifies their understanding we live in a 3D world. So next steps, we want to be present all around the earth. We need to find investors, funds, partners, create alliances to start the internationalization phase, scale the market, and to continue with the R&D to enhance Hatton ecosystem. We are living in a golden age of earth observation, and this is the right moment for companies like Tinkerest to make a return to society of the investment in science and technology 
maybe European institutions like ESA. An Earth observation can help us to contribute with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the same framework for disaster risk reduction, and the European Commission Green Deal. So let's support innovative Earth observation tools for the benefit of society. Thank you very much. Everyone, my name is Johan and I'll be presenting our idea, we support. Our goal is to simplify marine business. Oceans and coral reefs are simply the backbone of a multitude of ecosystem and human livelihood. Unfortunately, we have already lost or severely damaged more than 50% of coral reefs and 85% of oyster beds worldwide. Studies estimate nearly all reefs will be at risk by 2050 unless action is taken now to reduce the threats. These alarming projections are increasingly becoming a major challenge in many parts of the world. We aim to change that. Our mission is to take practical action and support the blue economy using, using technology. Our focus therefore lies on marine businesses that rely on healthy reef systems such as aquaculture and fisheries, beaches, and aquaculture management. Our approach produces data which is used to build a pic picture of a singular aquaculture farm, for example, that is comprehensible and rapidly accessible to the business owner through a user-friendly web application. The three main issues in current remote monitoring solutions are costs, because it's usually expensive to implement such a project, scale, for example, different biospecies require different data, and time, which is extremely sensitive to a coastal manager or a farmer. Now, we've all heard of precision agriculture. Our aim is to build precision aquaculture. In the coming months, we first plan on growing our current team of four to a team of at least eight members, as well as applying for additional funding. Secondly, we will perform a more extensive market study and design our reef support pilot project, which is entitled reef.io. All this is in hope of applying for the ESA Business Incubation Center, located in North by the Netherlands next year in April, which we are eligible for. To gain additional information on our project, please visit our website titled reef.support. Thank you so much for your interest and attention. Hi, I'm Jaroslav from Coast Mapper team, where we provide coastal zones monitoring tools based on the current satellite derived bathymetry. Coastal zones monitoring is a growing issue. We see importance to support various applications such as safety of navigation, coastal service, coastal zone management, or hydrodynamic modeling. The coastal zones monitoring is quite common thing to do, but nowadays systematic acquisition of bathymetric data of coastal zones is expensive and inefficient. There is a lack of tools that could obtain the bathymetry more often and cheaper. So, if you want to be a serious partner for administration and industry, you actually need to be able to create data based on current satellite derived bathymetry and multispectral observations. You also need to have a professional knowledge about ICT technologies and satellite data. And this is exactly what we are doing in our Coast Mapper project. Thanks to use of analytical and artificial intelligence algorithm of processing uh, satellite data, Coast Mapper will be able to estimate coastal bathymetry in optical shallow waters. As a result, the system user will have access to current bottom maps, which will allow assessing bottom defects, the effects of human interference in nature and assessing the effects of correct, corrective actions of their planning. Our solution is a part of satellite uh, maps market. The market is growing rapidly and now is worth 500 million euro yearly only in the European Union. Our team is a group of people with a strong background on satellite data, IoT technologies, software and business development. We provide a modular solution, which is easy to integrate with existing software. We use state-of-the-art IoT technologies. So far, we have implemented our solution in the Institute of Oceanology of Polish 
Academy of Science, where we monitor the Gdańsk Bay Area. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. Greetings from Gdańsk. Hello everyone, on behalf of the Science as a Service team, I'm happy to introduce our idea how to increase the usability of Earth observation data. Main obstacles for end users have been the access to data and computing capabilities, which are partially solved now. However, one of the main challenges remains, which is to develop methods to produce information and obtain the necessary knowledge for this. Our idea is a web service where users can directly obtain spectral categorizations from optical images such as Sentinel-2 and create their own applications based on this. The algorithm behind that is a physical model-based, knowledge-based decision tree that is implemented in a software called SIEM and it is fully automated. It does not require any training data or parameterization and is globally applicable. We optimize this algorithm for the cloud and produce a web application that is ready for Copernicus Big Earth Observation data and can be accessed by people even if they are not experts in Earth observation. Our aim is a scalable SIEM as a service that works everywhere in the world, whether the images are from Europe, from Asia or somewhere else. In this example, you see two images that have been processed fully automated just within minutes. And also they are from different parts of the world. They share the same comparable legends and are only two examples of 20 million images in the archive. The main asset of SIEM as a service is that it is the first semantic enrichment that works fully automated without training data or parameterization. It is therefore perfectly suited for global applications such as monitoring essential variables, monitoring sustainable development goals, contributing to the digital earth or other applications. It is also possible to create additional services on top of this, for example, automated change detection or agricultural monitoring. The extension to other optical images are also possible. Our next step is therefore to apply for funding to make this happen and we are looking forward to demonstrating this prototype to you. Hello, everybody. My name is Flavio Proietti Bantossi, and today I will present UGEO on behalf of our team. Today, almost 50% of the world population lives in urban areas, and by 2030, it will be 70%. The problem is that at the moment, our cities are not prepared. The required urbanization process, together with the increase in urban population, must be coherent and sustainable. A key to solve the problem lies in green infrastructure development and management, as it provides key ecosystem services. However, at the moment, there is no tool able to merge urban planning and management with such needs, and Earth's observation data might offer an answer. UGEO stands for Urban Green from Earth Observation and is an artificial intelligence system based on Earth observation data. How it works? Data gathered by Earth observation satellite are exploited in order to evaluate and propose new organization of green areas based on key performance parameters related to green infrastructure efficiency. Specifically, the data exploited in this beta version using a suburb of Milanus test bench have been the NDVI LST and NO2 concentration. To summarize, UG is the first machine learning based algorithm able to intersect data acquisition from Copernicus constellation with urban planning, resource management, and green infrastructure in order to support decision makers while planning urban development and managing green infrastructure. What is the business opportunity here? Well, every city in the world needs to spend money to manage its green infrastructure. Cities such as New York, Paris, and London spend about 30 euros per year per inhabitant for green areas management. And this amount is to be paired with health and well-being expenses, making up a market worth billions. UGO's business model is based on two services, initially targeting administrators and real estate firms. One is the analysis and strategic planning of urban green areas. 
And the second focus is on maintenance and monitoring. This ensures key advantages in terms of sales cycles and cash flow. Your geo obviously lives in the present, and that's why we're looking to set up pilot projects in three European cities by 2021. However, our vision is to develop UGEO as a 360-degree street for urban Earth observation applications. To make this a reality, we have recently started the Copernicus Accelerator Program and are now looking for partnerships with local administrators and investors who believe that smarter and more sustainable cities are the key for a better urban future. Thank you for your attention. Feel free to get in touch. So, Candice, picking up on Angsa Robotics and the cosmic ray water leak detection, do you think Hatem could be your digital twin for your garden? <laughs> um, Hatem, uh, yes, it, <laughs> it, it could be. Um, this was the, the Tinkers, is that correct? Yes, yes yeah. that's correct. Yeah, the, yeah, the Tinkers. Um, the, I, um, you know, I, I actually, I see truly a, a much larger, you know, application. Uh, I really liked, you know, the idea that, um, um, Milena said about, you know, having this be Earth's digital twin. So, you know, I can see it um, really, you know, taking the temperature, I mean, do, doing everything, visualizing our, our Earth. Um, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was an excellent um, approach uh using all of the technologies not just one technology but you know all of them to really give this 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 digital twin um i was very very impressed uh with it and of course i was thrilled that there were three uh, founders who are are women um i think that uh another company that I, I really did like indeed was this last one, uh, UGO. Uh, you know, I, I would uh, I would tell the founder to maybe, you know, do something like making cities livable. Um, what I liked was taking, you know, so many times we analyze the data and we give it, but here, you know, they were really saying, this is what we do and the product is to make the city greener. So it's not just analyzing, it's saying, this is what you need to do to make the city greener. Uh, I liked this very much. Um, the, um, uh, you know, the, the emphasis on the uh, oceans, um, I think also very exciting that we just had this new satellite, um, a cooperation between ESA and NASA for the oceans. I think this is just such a, a great, um, uh, a, a great initiative and accomplishment. Um, so, you know, I I once asked a friend who was the head of and kind of a guru of earth observation and I said you know why have you been doing this you know for the last 25 years and you know he said it, it's so that we can identify the polluters you know that we can really um say you're doing this and 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 you have to stop it and I'd just like to give a tip maybe to uh, some of our founders, because I think a real opportunity is being missed by um, all of these earth observation or, you know, aquaculture and ocean observation companies uh, with the sustainable development goals. And that is that every single company in the world, be it Coca-Cola, be it, 
you know, the, the gold mines, be, you know, every, every single large company in the world needs to show that they are doing something to make our earth better and to make our planet better. And so, you know, even if there's not a direct um, application, if those companies can be associated and, 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 and even invest in our earth observation companies and say, you know, use it as an advertising, you know, tool and say, we are investing in these companies, you know, to make the world better. So um, I liked all of them. I thought they were great. I, I'm a, you know, I used to say, well, you know, I, I did telecommunications. So I used satellites for, to create Astra with, for satellite television, then Teleport Europe for telecommunications, then Iridium for mobile communications, and then Europe Online uh, for broadband internet. So I was always using satellites for um, universal access. And I tell everybody the last 10 years, I went from using space for universal access to accessing the universe. And um, so when I think it was Melina said, you know, this is the golden age of Earth observation, I, I agree with her. Um, this is the future. You know, we really, really um, need to power this up, scale it up, you know, even more. Thank you, Candice. I think you already answered my next question to you. Basically, I wanted to know if environment and sustainability are an argument for private investors too, or just for the public sector. But I think you, uh, you already mentioned that you think both are, both yes, is the case. I will, I, will, I will actually go a little bit further. And I have, um, I think I can share this um, with um, the world. <laughs> uh, I, you know, as, as president of EBAN, I European Business Angels Network, I started EBAN Space. And um, I'm now the president emeritus of IBAN, but I'm a, still a member of IBAN Space together, by the way, with Uli. And uh, we have a lovely, lovely uh, partnership with ASA now for over 10 years. And, you know, as I said at the beginning, the, um, you know, the, the, the fact that ASA is the world's largest incubator for space is just absolutely amazing. And recently, um, uh, I, I suggested to our friends at, at, at um, I think it's called PyLab, uh, or no, PyLab, Fi, Fi, Fi I guess, yeah, PyLab, uh, which is the kind of, you know, incubator for the, um, uh, for the Earth observation in particular, and, you know, there's a program that the European Commission has also funded called uh, Corporate Startup Stars Awards. And it basically brings together corporations who work with um, startups and um, to have the corporations bring the inno open innovation of the startups into their own large companies. And so what I've suggested now to ASA is that we expand this program specifically to bring corporations in Europe together with these, um, you know, environment, earth observation startups um, so that they can then tell the world, hey, you know, this is what we're doing. We are bringing all of this wonderful innovation that's happening in the environment and earth observation, we're bringing it into our corporations and then making these you know, public and making them be stars. So connection and marketing is the key word of this session, I think. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> Uli, uh, do you think it's possible to make money with green technology? Investors usually have a higher interest in a turnover than in sustainability or am I wrong? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's like Candice said earlier, investors do need to make a return on investment. And it makes no difference whether we invest our own private money, hard-earned money um, on a crowd investing platform, or whether um, I invest as a venture capital investor the money that um, banks and pension funds have given me to invest. I, I need to make a return on investment. However, um, it, it is really, really, um, the world is changing. Um, also, the investment world is really changing. 
10 years ago when I raised um, money from institutional investors, maybe 1% of those investors asked whether um, we as a venture capital firm have a strategy um, for sustainability. And that could mean that we have a strategy that we are um, respectful of how we deal with, how we work with people. That could, have, that could mean that we have um, a good governance strategy. That could mean that we have um, specific rules and, and guidelines regarding environmental issues. That 10 years ago, 1% of the investors asked. Um, five years ago, maybe 10% of investors had a box they needed to take in their checklist whether the people they give money to have strategies for environmental and societal social um, uh, questions. Nowadays, every investor asks. There's more, investor, more and more investors who say, we will not invest if you don't have an appropriate strategy. Not only tell us that you have one, explain us what it is. So the world is really changing rapidly and to the better because with that, that focus forces us and the companies we invest in to really think about the, um, the, the impact that goes beyond the economic and investment return impact. And um, because of that focus, it becomes also increasingly easy um, to invest in um, sustainable companies. It was much more difficult for us to, to, um, to commit money to businesses where the return of investment was maybe two years later, three years later, um, because it was a much more challenging business case, but a very sustainable one. But now we have the, um, the approval of our investors to also invest in companies where return of investment might be a little later but because of sustainability questions, um, that, that's becoming acceptable. So that's really exciting and good news. Um, it, it's, um, it, 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 it adds a, a very important component um, to the prerequisite. We should never forget the prerequisite is we make an investment return. And that will never go away when you talk to investors. The nice thing is that there's now other um, aspects to take into consideration. I am really glad to hear this, uh, Uli, um, especially thinking of future generations to come. Um, this connects us to the Green Deal again, Martina. Since the Green Deal and sustainability are the topics of the European Commission, which of the solutions we just heard would you present to Ms. von der Leyen and which fits best to your political strategy? Very honest, uh, I would like to present all. <laughs> um, and um, not only because um, they are really convincing uh, in their approaches, um, but what, and I may say, it, what is still a bit our, our problem, and I talk uh, also on behalf of my, of my colleagues, uh, what we see to, today um, is amazing, but in a way familiar for us. Um, this is not at all the case for many other commission services. This is not the case uh, for many people outside the commission. Simply say uh, the awareness of uh, what space-based data signals can contribute is unfortunately still not very, very high. So, um, we are very, very hard working to raise this awareness very concretely. And this is one of, uh, if I may say, the core task also of our, of our unit, um, to bring space into Horizon Europe, into the Green Deal. Um, again, what I said, um, we know and we see it again uh, tonight that so many, in principle, all, all projects can contribute to um, the objectives of the Green Deal. 
And I found very interesting um, what Uli just said, looking back, what was the situation 10 years ago? What was the situation five years ago? Concerning the awareness also from the investor side concerning green objectives, environmental and societal objectives. Um, and you said also the world is changing. This is right. And um, I think in Europe we can be very optimistic that with the Green Deal um, and its very ambitious objective, the world might be changing a little bit faster. And um, it would be very, or it will be very interesting to see in five years, in 10 years, um, what role, again, environmental, societal aspects will play in big in investments. Um, I'm also convinced that uh, even the thinking, the traditional thinking in what is capital um, will change. Capital will certainly always be money, um, but with these impacts and with these really ambitious objectives, the Commission said, capital will also perhaps be redefined in uh, natural sources, in, in uh, air quality, in water availability. So all these factors which had so far in very often neglected become now more and more important in also decision making for for private in investments and uh, this i must say is um, a very very promising uh, development and again um, yes i wished uh, we could take all proposals and and show them to to the world just to see we are not talking about uh, theoretical um, ideas we have really very very concrete solutions, uh, which all at the moment are perhaps a little stone for the mosaic, but um, this mosaic will grow and we bring more and more and more little pieces together and um, this will make this will make a, a difference. Thank you, Martina. And I really do hope that since this year, it's the first year that the European Space Week is digital and also our events are digital, that we do have a broader audience, which is all around the globe. So I hope that um, what Martina said is the case and that our solutions that have been presented by our winners today will have a bigger audience than we even had in the past years. So... Yeah. Thank you again, ladies, for discussing all these cases. Before you leave us, please stay here. I do have one last question for you. After you uh, heard 30 Galileo and Copernicus solutions from our winners today, what is your favorite candidate for a Galileo solution and a Copernicus solution? And who has the potential of becoming the overall winner of both competitions tomorrow in the Space Awards? Martina, would you like to start? <laughs> Uh, this is the most difficult question <laughs> <laughs> you could ask me. Um, um, there are, of course, um, some uh, proposals, um, yeah, which are a bit, um, I would not say striking, but okay, they you hear, you hear about them and you don't forget them. This is clear. So um, this is my very personal opinion, um, the three proposals under the health issue um, are the ones uh, which I really will remember. Uh, as I said, um, the use of space data and Galileo signals in health applications is still in an infantile phase and uh, these um, proposals um, really demonstrated very nicely the big potential also in this area. Then, of course, um, very nice, the, um, um, the cleaning roboter is certainly something which is also something you don't, uh, you don't forget. Um, and then, and this is a bit linked to um, the commission challenges uh, we had defined for, for this year, 
um, the proposals related to um, the marine and the ocean sectors, um, I find a really, really uh, remarkable project. But again, I would say this is the difficult, the most difficult question you could uh, you could ask uh, tonight. <laughs> I guess so, but we want to be curious for tomorrow. <laughs> so um, only <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I don't know. We will see. We will, we will see. This is the surprise. <laughs> Definitely, Willie. What is your opinion? Okay, so let's see. First of all, um, what I personally find most exciting is um, the involvement um, that we have seen in the kind of proposals over the years. Um, because we see now so many very specific business ideas, not only technical solutions and ideas for potential products, but startups that are presenting a, a concrete product or service um, and that look to get this out to the market. So that's, for me, um, the most important aspect um, of, uh, of tonight's discussion. Um, in regards to Copernicus, uh, my personal favorite is Tradewind um, because I think they have the, um, they, they really solve a big need um, with a relevant solution and they do it in a smart way. Um, I, I have tried to find my most favorite um, solution for um, Galileo. Um, and I need to go a little earlier in the, um, in the, <laughs> in the evening or in the afternoon. And actually, I have to say um, uh, what I like much um, in regards to Galileo solutions is Field Scout. Um, there is a lot of proposals in regards to precision agriculture, but here I like this approach that is really customer centric. Um, we spoke to farmers, we put it on the device they use anyways, we enable them to do this in real time while they are in the field. And I think this, this degree of practicality, ease of use, um, inexpensiveness of solution um, is a super attractive um, utilization of the Galileo precision. So that is my um, favorite for, the, for Galileo. So, Field Scout it is and uh, Tradewind. Candice, yeah. what is yours? And, and thank you for letting me go last. <laughs> you know, what I do is when I finish something, you know, then I tear it up. Trash. <laughs> <laughs> you, you picked out all the stuff from the trash. <laughs> Putting all of my pieces back together again. I have taken copious notes. So, um, uh, woo. Um, the well, I the, the the one my 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 overall favorite. Yes, yes. Um, really is the tinkers, the the providing a digital twin for the earth. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just, I, I love it. Um, uh, it, um, uh, you know, it, it address, I, I like big problems. Um, I always tell everybody, you know, don't come to me with a small problem, come to me with a big problem and a big solution. So I, I very much like uh, the, 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 the tinkers. And, and as I say, I did love the fact that, you know, it, it is three uh, women because I do think that um, it brought a, a, another um, um, another perspective, you know, to really understanding everything that we were going to need to do to make our our earth better. Um, then I I really um, did like um, our friends from Mars. Um, so the um, the the cosmic ray. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that they were, as I said, I, I loved this. I, you know, here yes. again, you know, big <laughs> and oh, and solving, um, you know, big big problems. Um, I did very much like our friends from Sport VIP, the the visually impaired people. Um, people forget how, um, you know how 
visually impaired people are so important in our in our in our lives. Um, and then I um, I really uh, um, I really liked our our friends uh, in 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 the ocean. Um, yeah, I'm trying to find their name. Oh, the the um, the, the well, both both the, the reef.io and the um, coast mappers. They are obviously at a little different. Uh, you know, they're not at the same level as the the first three that I mentioned. And I thought it would be Anxa Robotics, Candice. <laughs> no, I mean, I I love I love it, but you know, as an investor. Mm -hmm. You have to, um, you know, you, you can't fall in love with the project. Um, so, you know, I might, I might, you know, I might invest my own money into them because I really do think they're fun. But, you know, normally you do need to look at the addressable market. You need to, you know, take into account um, uh, the scale and everything. I mean, I think they'll be great, but, um, you know, Usually, if you really love something, it, it's um, best just to invest your own money and not other people's money. Thank you, Candice, also for that last comment. And thanks again, ladies. It was a real pleasure to do this event together with you. And um, as Candice already said, we do not only unite in Europe with our competitions, but also as women in space. As you know, we are still underrepresented and I hope we could encourage more women to go out and into that specific field of interest as I think it is really fascinating and our future. Martina, Uli, Candice, thank you so much and I hope to see you again soon in real thank life. You. Thank you, certainly, certainly. Thank you, Ines. Thank so you, bye. you did a great bye. job. And, bye. and it was lovely to get to be with Uli and to meet you, Martina, and to, and to see you. So uh, thank pleasure. you. Yeah. Uh, Thanks bye -bye. again, Thank ladies. You. Bye. Bye. Now, to sum it up again, we learned a lot in, in this event today. And um, to summarize, it is really important to connect. Uh, all the solutions that we have heard coming from winners that um, they have similar solutions, but that also have a different approach to it. So I really want to encourage our winners to get in touch to go to our website of the Galileo Masters and the Copernicus Masters to find about the solutions that you just heard in our Hall of Fame and get the contact details of our winners. The website will be online tomorrow as there are still some winners which are unknown, the challenge winners that will come up in the Space Awards tomorrow. So stay tuned, um, dial in at 6 p.m. tomorrow. And now I'm really curious for tomorrow as um, our ladies had their favorite candidates already for the Galileo and the Copernicus solution. And tomorrow we will reveal the overall winner of Galileo Masters and Copernicus Masters. So, um, thanks again. And um, just stay, uh, stay in the European uh, Space Week website to see also the Space Awards tomorrow. A big thanks to our partners and the European Commission for making this event possible, to our prize partners all over Europe, and of course, to our winners. With your support, the competitions would not be what they are today. And thanks to you out there for joining today. I'm really looking forward to hear from you one way or the other. Have a nice evening, stay happy and healthy and have a Merry Christmas. Servus from Munich. <laughs>